Hello and welcome to Physics World. I'm Anna Deming. Now, if you're looking at something that's hard to find, you'll want to crank up the lighting. At Diamond, material science researchers can crank up the lighting to 10 billion times the power of the sun. In addition, the X-rays produced with a wavelength between 0.1 and 0.2 nanometers are highly penetrating, have a narrow beam profile and narrow energy that can be tuned between 5 and 23 kilo electron volts, opening up a wealth of structural and chemical information for materials research scientists. As the 7,000 paper reporting results from Diamond went to press, we went to take a look at the 31 beam lines at the main synchrotron, as well as the electron microscope instrumentation available at the Electron Physical Sciences Imaging Centre which alongside the Electron Bioimaging Centre provides a full suite of instrumentation for researchers in material science. This is Diamond Light Source, which is a facility for producing very intense beams of X-rays for studying a variety of materials. We do this by accelerating electrons, so there's initially electrons produced from a cathode that gives thermionic emission, and these are accelerated in a linear accelerator. They then get boosted in a second um, facility that we use uh, to accelerate those electrons, and then they eventually get put into our storage ring and circulate around the storage ring which is about 560 metres in circumference. Behind me you can see there's a, a concrete uh, roof and below that that's where the storage ring exists and the electron beam is kept in place by a whole variety of magnets and again behind me you can see there's a red magnet that is one of the types of magnet that we use to confine the beam and to deflect it so it goes around the circle. Every time that the electron beam goes through a magnetic field, it produces a beam of synchrotron radiation. And this is what we use in order to do the studies that we do here. Um, so day to day I'm supporting users that are coming in to do experiments on the beam line and they range from sort of biological samples, so looking at distributions of metal, nano, metal nanoparticles in, inside cells, or material science um, experiments, so it's looking at the structure of catalysts, or the users today looking at the structure within a weld in a, inside a material. So we've had um, a sample of um, a meteorite that, that's, that's landed and um, some people from the Natural History Museum have got that on there, that was quite cool. We got a space sample on the beam line um, and then the biological ones are the ones that really amaze me, how they can take cell samples and prepare them, that you can see them under a microscope and, and see them on the beam line is, is, is quite cool. Um, what I have here on the end of this pin is a tiny fragment of paint from a painting of Homer by Rembrandt from 1663. Now, as with many oil paintings of that age, uh, they suffer from degradation over time. The colour can change and small white blooms or crusts will form on the surface of the painting. And this will disfigure the painting and can cause small bits such as this fragment to fall off. Now, working with a team from the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, we were interested in identifying the exact chemical composition of this crust. And so we came to Diamond Light Source and we used the microfocus X-ray beam here to do a tomography experiment on this um, fragment of paint. Now what the tomography did, we scanned the sample at lots of different angles, similar as you would get a CAT scan at a hospital to get a 3D image of what's inside you. Uh, we can use the extremely bright x-rays at Diamond to get a 3D image of the chemical structure inside, in this case, the paint fragment. And from this we were able to identify the different uh, compounds, this is a lead paint, and we were able to identify how the lead paint had reacted with atmospheric pollutants such as sulphur dioxide over time to form this white crust which was disfiguring the painting. And using this information, the conservation team at the Rijks Museum can now investigate further as to how best to preserve and potentially reverse this degradation process. Normally, a lab-based diffractometer has uh, quite a large beam profile of a few millimetres in size. Um, 
sample here is much less than one millimetre and so a lab based source, whilst it would be able to tell us most of the phases here, it would not give us any spatial information, it wouldn't let us know which phases are at the surface of the painting, which are in the middle and which are down right upon the chalk layer near the canvas. Further to that, the lab based source just doesn't have the flux, it doesn't have the intensity of x-rays to be able to image such small volume and that's why we needed to use diamond. So we're 185 metres away from, from the diamond ring um, and our beam pipe is in a vacuum tube actually under the road on the way here but most of our components we can control just from the desk here or we can even log in from home and control them from home if we like. Okay so the x-rays come into the hutch um, through this vacuum tube behind me and they come from 185 metres away over the road and once they, they come into this hutch they um, come into this side of our vacuum vessel here. So this side is under ultra high vacuum and the reason for that is to keep our mirrors nice and clean. So we use mirrors for the focusing and to achieve the nano focus the, um, the surface finish on those mirrors needs to be almost perfect and they're also very slightly curved to, to focus the x-rays. So we keep them under a really high vacuum to keep them nice and clean and, and dust free. Um, and once the beam has been focused it comes through to the other side and, it, and hits the sample. So once the beam is focused, it comes out of the vacuum vessel um, and hits the sample sat here. Um, the tricky part is then aligning the part of the sample that you want to look at with where the X-ray beam is focused. So we have various cameras um, to check the alignment and to check we're looking at what we want to see. Um, the sample mount is um, is designed so that it can hold the same sample holders as um, the TEM. So someone might want to do an, an experiment um, on a TEM and bring the same sample here. Um, so we've tried to make that easy um, to transfer across. And the sample here is then sat on a stack of um, XYZ um, translation stages so we can scan the sample through the beam um, with a precision sort of smaller than the beam size so we can pinpoint exactly where um, different elements are located um, within the sample. So the bottom stages are what we call the coarse stages, but the step size on those is around about 50 nanometers, so in most terms that's not really coarse. Um, and then we have our fine stages, which are kind of a piezo um, motor stack, and we can step, say, two to five nanometers with those. Um, because we're at a synchrotron, um, the, the x-rays that we get are highly coherent, so they're all in phase, and that's essential for focusing down to, down to this level. You wouldn't be able to do that with x-rays from, say, a lab source. And another bonus um, from a synchrotron is that we're energy tunable, so we can tune our energy to look at different specific elements um, with it within the sample, which you can't do so easily in the lab source. So um, the main challenge is everything is very small. Um, so our beam is very small and the samples are very small. So it's kind of how to handle that, how to find the right bit of the sample that you're looking on. And, and that's actually one of the things that's quite useful, having the, the electron microscopes next door, because they're really used to handling really small things. So it's, it's different in that we're using X-rays rather than electrons um, to look at our sample. And what that means is X-rays are a bit more penetrating, so they can get through a lot more material. So for a TEM experiment, you'd have to thin your sample um, down so that the electrons can get through it, whereas we don't quite have much the same issue with the X-ray. So you can look at thicker samples, which is, is kind of complementary to the, um, the electrons. You can kind of look at a big sample here, say actually I'm interested in this bit, and then maybe even go on to, to cut that section out and thin it down to, to look in the, um, the electron microscopes. Um, another thing that we're quite strong on is spectroscopy. Um, so uh, we're a lot more sensitive um, to the um, small traces of elements within our sample and um, so we can find low concentrations of say things like platinum and um, within a catalyst a lot easier than you could if you were doing the experiment on an electron microscope. So EPSIC itself um, is a centre that was founded in or opened in 2016 and it's a partnership, a three-way partnership between Diamond Light Source, the University of Oxford and Johnson Matthey PLC were one of the UK's major catalyst companies. So this is one of the instruments we have in this national facility and this is one of the world's highest resolution electron microscopes capable of resolving spacings of 47 picometers. So the instrument itself, this is a 300,000 volt instrument with an electron source, it's a field emission electron source at the very top here, a series of corrected optics forming a condenser lens system. The objective lens is here and the sample goes in at this plane here and then we have a series of corrected optics for the objective and then projector lenses and right at the bottom here we have a detector chamber with a range of very fast fast cameras running up to a thousand frames a second 
high resolution cameras and specialist detectors for, for specific experiments. So, so what, what we provide to the UK science community as a national centre is we provide a very, very high performance instrument which is not generally going to be available in most university laboratories but we also provide um, expert staffing so that users who don't have the expertise to drive the instrument themselves can come here and our staff scientists will carry out the experiments for them. My role is to maintain both the microscopes, keep them up and running. Um, our primary function here is as a, as a user centre, so our, our, our chief uh, priority is to make sure that the users can come here and that their experiments run smoothly and they go away with excellent experimental data. So that's my prime role. Okay, so the, the microscopes we have here are um, very high resolution transmission electron microscopes. So we're looking, we're always looking at the atomic structure of the materials. That's what we do. Um, so in that sense, uh, the experiments to a certain extent are similar, but we look at a very wide range of different material systems. So um, we may, may well be looking at, uh, we do quite a lot of work on low dimensional materials, so, so graphene, molybdenum, disulfide, uh, things like that. We also do a lot of work on, on catalyst materials with the, with the uh, chemistry community, so that generally is looking at small nanoparticles uh, of the order of a few nanometers and again trying to understand uh, the, uh, the, the atomic structure of these things, how uh, different chemical elements are dispersed within the nanoparticles, what the, what the surface terminations are, these sorts of things. So that's that's a lot of our work. Um, battery materials. We look at um, a, a wide range of, uh, of energy materials. Uh, uh, um, lots of work is done at the moment on, on lithium-based uh, battery materials. Um, we have um, users who come in who who maybe will be looking at. Um, faults in, in, in steels that have been that, that, that perhaps might be used in the aerospace industry or, or materials for the nuclear industry. Very, very wide range. So it's all it's all material science samples. So we don't do um, at the moment any any soft matter, any any biology. Um, but the, the the whole range of basically anything that we can make thin enough that we can get electrons through it and is stable under the electron beam, uh, we will we, we, we will look at. Uh, I've been coming to Diamond uh, the Diamond Campus for, for many years to do experiments using the synchrotron. I'm here today to use one of the EPSIC electron microscopes to, um, uh, with my research group working on uh, corrosion of zirconium alloys used in the nuclear industry. So zirconium alloys are the, 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 uh, um, the preferred fuel cladding alloys in, in pressurized water reactors. Um, so they separate the water, the, 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 the coolant uh, water, from the fuel, which is uranium dioxide. And you really don't want the water and the fuel to get together. That's extremely uh, uh, dangerous. So the zirconium has to be very corrosion resistant and survive in the uh, environment inside a reactor, which is very hostile. It's hot, high pressure, but also lots of, of neutron damage. Um, and the zirconium corrodes. It does, it does corrode. It grows an oxide layer. And the oxide layer is what we're studying here. Um, we're trying to understand how it grows and how um, hydrogen and oxygen in particular move through it um, because that's the corrosion reaction that we're trying to limit so that we can leave the fuel rods in the reactor for longer, burn more of the uranium and generate more electricity for the same in input cost of the fuel. So when the fuel goes into the reactor, the, uh, the operator of the reactor has to make a decision about how long to leave it in there. Um, at the moment we burn up between 30 and 40 percent of the uranium and we bring the rods out in a, uh, um, very conservatively because as the oxide layer grows hydrogen from the water is getting into the zirconium and embrittling it and uh, so there, it, it becomes dangerous to leave it in for too long. You don't want an accident to happen obviously so you make an engineering decision when to pull the fuel out. You always do it very early because it's uh, to be conservative to be safe. That costs a lot of money, they're pulling it out. Every time you turn a reactor off for a day, it costs a million pounds. It's a million pounds worth of electricity you are not generating. Um, so if you can leave the fuel rods in for longer, it it's, uh, um, generates less nuclear waste and also it's of high value to the, uh, um, the operator of the, of the reactor. Um, so if we can give the operators, the industry, um, enough information that says, yes, it's safe, um, to leave those rods in for longer, that alloy will survive longer in, in the hostile environment than, than another one, then they can generate the value, if you like, of burning up more fuel. Ten years ago, 
I didn't work in this field at all, and we were asked questions. So the industry came to us and said, can you tell us what is happening at this atomic scale, the nanoscale, inside these complex materials under conditions of high pressure and high temperature? And so with them, with actually a, a group of, of um, uh, international industry and uh, partners in, in Sweden, in the US, uh, in France, and in, in Switzerland, we've developed a set of experimental techniques that can look at these reactions with great precision at the atomic scale to try and understand the fundamental mechanisms. And that's interesting to a scientist to be asked a question, can you deploy your experimental skills to answer an industrially relevant question? That's the kind of thing we like. And so that's how I got into it. The technology of the microscope has come massively in the last 10 years or so, and it's sort of beginning to reach, for material science, it's beginning to reach a sort of steady state. So rather than um, people really working hard to develop the hardware, the hardware of the microscope, people are now looking at different things they can do with the hardware. And one of these is in situ experiments. So it's one thing looking at a sample at room temperature, um, sat on its grid under the electron beam, but that's not necessarily how a catalyst, for example, that's not the environment a catalyst would really be operating in, or that's not the, the, the environment a, um, uh, a, a, a device, an electronic device made out of graphene would really be operating. Very challenging though. At the moment I'm focusing on um, uh, very high temporal resolution imaging. So we have, we, we, we are uh, heavily involved with a spin-out company from, from Diamond Light Source who, who uh, uh, um, sell these very fast cameras. So we've been working with them to develop the camera for the for, for, for the electron microscope, um, and uh, one of the big benefits that's given us is we've got access to this technology really quite early on. So there's not very many labs internationally that have that, that have these these very very fast cameras. There's been a lot of work done uh, in the literature, some of which I've been fortunate enough to be involved in, that have looked at how um, defects and uh, dopants um, evolve dynamically. So you'll, 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 you'll take an image and then you wait a period of time you'll take another image. And there's lo lots of great work being published on this, but it's been done at um, sort of one frame per second, so one hertz. By having these new cameras that can go very, very fast, we can start to see some of this, this fast molecular uh, motion that we haven't been able to see before. Um, one reason why I'm so excited about, about this is the computational chemists um, who uh, can, can, can do calculations of these things. Um, these calculations are very complex and take a huge amount of computational power. They can now, with the latest codes and the latest computers, do these calculations over time periods which are, which are approaching millisecond time periods. So we're, they're, they're, they're coming from a theoretical end approaching millisec millisecond time periods. We're coming from a experimental end and we're coming down and approaching these millisecond time periods as well. So we're potentially getting, getting to, the, to the stage where we can directly um, compare what the computational chemists are telling us about the, the lifetimes of, uh, of various things in our sample with di directly with our, our, our imaging. And that for me is, is really quite exciting.